Hi everybody and welcome to episode number 15 of the Australian Rock Show, Oz Rock's loudest and proudest music podcast. My name is Colin Gray from the Rockin' and Rollin' Gray Brothers and today is Saturday the 18th of April 2015 when this show is being recorded. Boris Sujevic was at the forefront of the Perth punk scene of the late 70s. From his time with the scientists through to the Beasts of Bourbon and then on to the Dubrovniks, Boris has left his mark on Australian rock and roll in no uncertain terms. In the late 80s and early 90s, the one band I looked forward to seeing more than any other was the Dubrovniks, and I was fortunate to have seen them a stack of times around the pubs of Sydney. Yet they were more than a pub band. With a pedigree that boasted ex-members of the Scientists, Spectre's Revenge, Headstones, Beasts of Bourbon, Girlies and the Hoodoo Gurus, to name but a few, they were indeed an inner city supergroup. Decked out in black leather jackets, they were the epitome of cool. They had great songs and a major label behind them. Indeed, the formula was right for success. The Dubrovniks as a band, though, never had the success in Australia they deserved. And it was the pubs, in Australia anyway, that were to be their stage. European audiences, however, took to the band, with the Dubrovniks playing countless festivals across Europe, including headlining over bands like Faith No More. The Dubrovniks played blistering, power-packed, guitar fueled rock and roll, short, sharp and driven by big, fat guitars. It was always a mystery to me why more people were not into the Dubrovniks. Yet, 20 years after their demise, the Dubrovniks are back together with shows booked throughout Europe in June this year. We caught up with Boris on Monday the 13th of April and chewed the fat about the band's past, present and future. Before we get to the interview, let me seduce your sonic senses. From 1994, this is the Dubrovniks with Hernando's Hideaway. Boris, welcome to the Australian Rock Show. Yeah, great, thank you. You're welcome. Look, we opened the show with uh, Hernando's Hideaway from 1994's Medicine Wheel album. I mean, right. that's very autobiographical, isn't it? And a tune that was all about you growing up in Perth in the late 70s, yeah? Uh, y- yes. Well, uh, yeah, us growing up, yeah, because it was also, um, it was James Baker who wrote the lyrics. It was about us, yeah, basically starting up a club called Hernando's Hideaway. Yeah, I did. It's, a, it's a fantastic tune and look, probably one of the favourite tunes on that album. But look, straight off the, the bat, I wanted to say that I think it's it's great news that the, the band are back together some 20 years after disbanding. And, and I have to sort of own up and, and say from the outset that this could be a little bit of a biased interview because I was a, a big fan of the Dubrovniks and I saw the band many, many times over a number of years and a number of lineups. But significantly, around 90 to 92, I don't think there was any other Australian band that could match it with the Dubrovniks. So welcome back. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And look, as a as a pioneer of the late 70s Perth punk scene with uh, the Rockets and the Exterminators, right through to your time with, I guess, notably the Scientists and then the Beast of Bourbon, we yeah. could easily devote an entire show to your time with each of those bands. And in the future, we hopefully we will. But as the Dubrovniks have gotten back together and are about to embark on a European tour, I thought it pertinent and perhaps appropriate to concentrate solely on the Dubrovniks for this show. So... First off, what has prompted the band to reunite after all this time? Was it playing together at the benefit show for Mick Blood? No, it wasn't that. There was talk about it earlier than that. And I guess I was doing a lot of other things. You know, I was doing some scientist shows overseas a lot. Yeah. And we did the Beast of Bourbon things and all that. So I kind of, I was I was the one who was saying, oh, not now, not now. And eventually I had a bit of time and I thought, well, okay, yeah, well, let's, let's do a couple of shows. Basically, I just wanted to do one show maybe in Athens or something because we were quite popular over there. And the impetus for that was that a, a, a local Greek band had a kind of big hit with one of our songs a few years ago. And so I thought, oh, well, let's just go over there and do a, do a gig, but... So it's kind of ballooned out into a few more gigs now. So um, but that, that's mm-hmm. the main reason. It's, I wouldn't call it a reformation as such. I, well, I guess it is, isn't it? <laughs> mm. um, well, yeah, I mean, and that's that's the impetus for the uh, for the regrouping anyways. So the, the current lineup includes yourself, James Baker, Chris Flynn, and both Peter Simpson and Glenn Armstrong. How, how is it working out with three guitars? Very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you've got to, got to stop guitars from playing, <laughs> <laughs> mm, true. But um, we've we worked it out really well now. I think you know everyone's excited to play because they haven't played for twenty years or something. You know? mm. so, so everyone was playing everything. But now we've 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 
kind of worked that out, but it is, is different. But it still sounds the same as well, you know. You've got to be aware of what everyone's doing more so than you did before. Okay, and you uh, mentioned to me the other day that you've recently done a, uh, um, a show at the Batten Ball Hotel in Sydney. Was that just to iron out some of the cobwebs? How did how did that go? That was basically just for my birthday. It wasn't a proper gig as such, because James Baker wasn't here. It sounded pretty um, like the Bovinks always sounded, I guess. So we'll, we'll touch upon the uh, forthcoming European tour uh, a little bit later, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about some of the band's plans for 2015. But what I'd, I'd like to do is to perhaps travel uh, travel back in time a little bit, if I can, mm-hmm. um, right to the, the beginning. So if we go back to 1986, in fact, and yourself, Roddy Radar, James Baker, and Pete Simpson get together as the adorable ones, but due to a Brisbane band using that name, you changed the name to the Dubrovniks. Is that correct? Is that how it got together? Yes. That's how it was. I never really liked the name The Adorable Ones, but that was kind of more of a, I don't know, it seemed like a bit of a joke to me, but, uh, but so luckily we had to change the name. Okay, and I think the, the Dubrovniks was certainly a, a name that was, uh, or a moniker that was easily identified. That was, both yourself and uh, and Roddy were born in the same Yugoslav village. No, our mothers were. That, that's, the, that's the connection, I guess, yeah. And look, I I think, you know, from a, from an outsider's or a fan's perspective, I, I really think there was three distinct periods of the band. You know, there was the the Roddy period, the Chris Flynn period, and then I guess post the Chris Flynn period. So if we can firstly go back to the first period of the band with Roddy, the, the press at the time, and I think it was Ian McFarlane, described the, the sound of the band as the Trogs meet T-Rex by way of the New York Dolls, which... I guess it's quite a cocktail when you when you think about it. What are your memories of this period with Roddy, who was certainly an enigmatic performer who probably could never quite find a permanent home in any number of the bands he did time in? Yeah, well, that's kind of um, Roddy's, Roddy's history there. Because <laughs> okay. um, um, I kind of grew up, I grew up with Roddy, so and mm. we were best mates kind of growing up all, all, all through the, our school. And when we started the Dubrovniks, he just left the Hoodoo Goos, was it, or, and the Johnnies, and, and there, was a, there was a million bands he'd kind of yeah, just absolutely. left. Or, so we we just basically got together to have a bit of fun, really. I just got back from England because um, I couldn't stay in England anymore with the scientists because uh, mm-hmm. well, I had visa problems. So I, I, I came back and we're basically just looking for a bit of fun, you know. I guess we were aiming to record an album and, you know, stupidly, for whatever reason, we wanted to make every song like a girl song, you know, like Speedway Girls or Dubrovnik. Okay. <laughs> Thankfully, you know, we never followed through with that, but that was the kind of thinking we were. Girls Go Maniac. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that, you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, nine, uh, 88, there's two great singles in Fireball of Love. There's a cover of Alvin Stardust's My Kukachu. Yet by mid-89, when the Speedway Girl 7-inch is released, both Roddy and his cheeseboard guitar have gone. Yeah. Why did Roddy leave, or was he fired? Did he leave, or was he fired? I think it was a bit of both. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but okay. that's the way it always ends with Roddy, I think. Okay. A bit of both. Okay. <laughs> so the band record and release the debut album, Dubrovnik Blues, with Chris Masurak producing in August 89 as a three-piece. Yeah. Was there any of a consideration to continue on as a three piece? I don't think so. We just did it as three uh, as three piece because we had to. Okay. Because uh, okay. we had, to, we had to, obviously the time booked or something, and Roddy had left or got booted out, which <laughs> okay. um, so you know probably a month before that or something. So Chris Flynn joins the band, and he and he brings with him elements of Bayou, Credence, Fogarty, Neil Young. I mean, he certainly was the missing piece of the puzzle for mine and certainly lifted the sound of the band, well, vocally. And at that time, I think he was, for me anyway, he was one of the best front men in Australia. I thought he was um, pretty hard to top when he was on when he was on song. Yeah. He, um, you agree with that? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, with everything, yeah. He's mm. definitely, he's got a great voice. Oh, he um, does, you know. He's... I mean, he can kind of belt it out. Mm. That's what you want to see in a rock and roll singer sometimes, isn't it? Mm. All, mm. all the time. So I guess you you spoke a little bit before about you know the band's impetus for writing uh, songs about girls. As a songwriter, I mean, other than say Andy Chernoff, I don't think there's another who has written as many songs about cars and girls as you have, Boris. Um, and look, as a fa- as a fan of both classic cars and pretty girls, um, that that always suited me fine, mate. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> No one's ever said that to me, but I, I guess that's <laughs> true. Um, 
I guess they're easy things to write about. And I kind of, when I'm writing, my kind of lazy gene kicks in. You know? <laughs> and I guess, um, I guess that that kind of comes to the fore. Even though I, I, I don't drive old cars, I just like the imagery that you know that an old Absolutely, car kind of yeah. inspires in, in things. So I guess that's why I kind of write about them a lot. Or you yeah. know, I like I, I like road movies, and you know, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie Badlands. I always I always like that, you know. So that's always Is kind that, of in the back yeah. of my mind, you know. Is Sissy Spacek in that one? Um, I'm not sure if it's her. Okay, all right. So I guess around. This time, both yourself and James Baker had also had commitments with the Beast of Bourbon. How how difficult was it to manage your time and commitment to both bands? Not that difficult, but it started getting difficult because both bands started touring Europe. So then then it became more difficult. Not not so much that they clashed. If we stayed with the Beast of Bourbon, we would always been in Europe, basically. You know, mm. the Brobnicks would go over, then we they'd come back, then. You know, a few months later, the Beast of Bourbon would go over, you know, so that was the main kind of reason that there'd be any conflict between between the two bands. Yeah. Okay, and when the Dubrovniks signed to Mushroom, was that the uh, reason that you decided, okay, well, I can't commit to both projects and we'll go full steam ahead with the Dubrovniks? No, not because of Mushroom, no, but okay, because of the time mainly. Was there was there any other label interest in uh, in the band other than Mushroom? No, I don't think so. But I, okay, um, there might have been, but I doubt it. Okay. So your, your debut album for Mushroom was Audio Sonic Love Affair, produced by Kevin Shirley, who at that time produced many mm-hmm. uh, Sydney bands. What what are your memories of working with Kevin Shirley, who I guess now has gone on to be a super successful producer? Yeah, um, he's good fun. He's kind of good fun to work with. He. Um, like all producers, he 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 put his stamp on on, on the not only the sound but but some of the songs as well. If he wasn't producing, Audio Sonic would have probably sounded a lot different. It was kind of good in a way that he mm-hmm. did Audio Sonic. I'm not sure there was the, the album after that that um, we should have kind of done it with him, but um, but yeah, definitely. It puts his stamp on it. Okay, um, look, and while we're talking about that, let's let's cut to a tune, if I may. It's December 1990. This is the Dubrovnik's title cut from 1990's Audio Sonic Love Affair, and folks, it doesn't get any better than this. All right, um, Boris, let's talk a little bit about uh, Europe, if we may, as that's always been a market that really took to the Dubrovniks. How did the band build its success in Europe? Was it Was it mainly through touring? I mean, I know that you had... Uh, product released on Normal in Germany, but who, who was pushing the band and, and how were people getting to to hear you? It was uh, probably a lot to do with Nor- Normal, the record label. They were a German-based one and they were, um, I think they were pretty good at what they did. Yeah, and we, and we toured over there about three or four or five times, you know, in that okay. period. You know, a lot, a lot of it's got to do with timing and when the record's out and the record company's got the right kind of publicity behind mm-hmm. the behind them and, and we play a lot you know and we get on the right kind of festivals then um, mm-hmm. and uh, if you're a half decent band you should kind of do well you know mm-hmm. so and that's kind I'm, of what happened as opposed to like the scientists in, in England but I think um, Normal was certainly um, pushing a lot of Australian product though at that time weren't yeah. they yeah. yeah well they, they had the beast of bourbon as well and that's right yeah um and that was originally our contact with them and a few other bands, yeah, and Lewis Tiller and things like okay. that. Yeah, so that, they were pretty good at what they did, looking back. Okay. The band released two albums on, on Mushroom, Audio Sonic Love Affair and the Chrome album. I mean, back then, it didn't seem to me anyway that Mushroom perhaps got behind the band and pushed either of those albums to, to any great extent. Look, I, I remember the, the Debbie Harry, Harry tour support I remember the two videos from the Audio Sonic Love album got a little bit of exposure, but not much else. Do you have an opinion on that? Were, I mean, were there other tour supports other than Debbie Harry that I've forgotten? No, nothing major. I'm not sure how uh, record companies kind of, well, there's major kind of record companies work, you know. Um, I, I guess they work off momentum maybe the same as anybody else does. If there seems to be something happening, they'll push a band more and more and cut their losses with other bands, you know. Mm. I don't know. Mm. I don't know if um, 
they can they can say, okay, right, that's the band we're going to... Oh, I guess they can to a certain extent. Um, they can say, well, this is the band we're going to push and we're going to push no matter what. But we weren't one of those bands, I guess. And they might have had some kind of initial push and didn't get the reaction they wanted, so they they must they would have backed off maybe, you know, and cut mm-hmm. their losses. I don't know. That seems to me the mentality of kind of record companies. Was it was it frustrating to you that the band was, was doing quite well live in Europe and, and back in Australia there seemed to be little support? I mean, I remember yeah. reading that you were playing festivals in Europe and you were headlining over bands like Faith No More, you'd come back here and you'd play to 30 people at the General Burke in Parramatta on a Thursday night. <laughs> was that, was that, because I was there. Were, were you frustrated by I that? We play there, did we? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can't remember being frustrated. I've got a kind of more philosophical view of life, so because you know, you know, I didn't believe that um, just because we weren't as successful over here as we were in Europe, that that was necessarily anybody's fault or the record company's mm-hmm. fault, or you know, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I just that's just the way it kind of was, you know. Mm, sure, but um, yeah. uh, well, I can't speak for all the other guys in the band, obviously, you know, who might have been a bit more. Um, frustrated than me but um, but um like i say we, we were doing quite well in europe and i was kind of happy with that well, while we're talking about europe can you perhaps provide some insight into some of those festivals uh, festivals that the band played in europe where and with whom like some of them perhaps were absolutely massive if you i saw a poster of a couple the other day and um, one in norway you know there must there must have been about 120 bands on you know and, mm. uh, and it ranged from you know uh, Paul Simon and and ZZ Top or something, uh, one mm-hmm. end of the scale and right down, you know, like the list just goes on and on and on, you know, mm-hmm. to the opening band and, and eighty five thousand people spread over, you know, this three day festival. <laughs> like it was absolutely massive. Amazing. And that happens every year. I think it's mm. still going. And other festivals in Germany in bloody football stadiums, you know. There, there was there was a there was a festival culture going on there long before it kind of happened over here and of course there's the smaller festivals as well you know you, you you're just driving along in the van and and the tour manager takes a kind of right turn up a hill and all of a sudden an hour or so going winding up a mountain and you're on top of a mountain and there's a kind of outdoor festival there you know snow-capped kind of or you know it was, it was hot when we're driving and an hour yeah. later we're freezing cold up on top of a mountain you know doing a festival you know Crazy yeah. stuff yeah. like that happens over there, and I, I think I mean obviously Europe's always had you know greater population concentration yeah. and population density than Australia, so the distances in Australia are just so far. Well, I know it's changed nowadays, but mm. back then it was a totally different scenario. It was, yeah. uh, you know, you're, and, and Amer- I guess America is comparable in, in that way to to yeah. Australia, the, the the distances and whatnot. But Europe has always been more accessible for, particularly for rock fans, to travel because of the the shorter distances. Yeah, and also um, it's all, all contained in a, in a certain area, like, like England as well, and that's what allowed mm. um, punk rock to explode so readily there. Because mm. you know, it was um, if it, you know it happened in London, and, and, it, and it, you know, hundred, two hundred kilometres away, is Manchester, Birmingham, you know, Liverpool, and you know, so it's all concentrated in one tiny area. Whereas in America, mm. you know, something could be happening on the West Coast and no one knows about on the East Coast or vice versa, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, who, who, who were your favourite UK punk bands while we're talking about that? Well, I guess just all the, the usual ones, you know. Obviously, Sex Pistols, when they when their, their singles came out and the early Clash stuff and The Damned and all those, mm-hmm. all those um, they, were, they were intermingled with a lot of the... American stuff like Heartbreakers, but there was also you know the more lesser known bands like the Adverts and sure um, Gary Gilmore's Eyes, yeah, yeah Gary Gilmore's Eyes and all that <laughs> stuff. You know that that was, did, that did, was great. Yeah, did the Dubrovniks ever play the UK? No, we never played okay. in the UK. But unfortunately, yeah, we we were about to, but something happened. But apparently, John Peel was a big fan of ours. Oh, okay, okay, um, and um, started playing some of our stuff. So we, we were kind of going to go on the back of that but yeah something went wrong if audio sonic love affair was a strong album i think that 1992's chrome album surpassed that i mean that that's a monster album that i'll level with you that stays permanently in my car cd player i mean that's that's more more on the metal side of things than previous material and you were perhaps being pushed in things like 
hot metal magazine in Australia. Chrome, I would think, would be one of my top 20 Australian albums of all time. There's so many amazing tunes on that, top to bottom. Yeah, it's right. consistently strong. French Revolution, Saigon Rose, Thinking of You. I think that's a way underrated album. But by the time Chrome was out, the band was doing, as you're alluding to, more and more shows in Europe, spending less time in Australia. I can't recall too many show, uh, shows I saw the band on during this period. Although mm. I, I do remember one night at the Vic on the Park. What are your thoughts on the Chrome album and that period for the band? Well, it was quite, it's a bit tainted because things were starting to fall apart okay. by then. So um, it's, uh, I'm the wrong guy to ask, I guess, you know, because <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing it through a totally different kind of view, I guess. Every time I, I see the Chrome album, I just see kind of disintegration, and um, which I'm not saying it was a bad album, but we weren't in control of it as much as, as the other albums were. You know, we were just letting things happen. But um, there you go, if, if, if you like it. <laughs> oh, look, I, I, think, I think those songs have, have uh, stood up with time inc- incredibly well. And I think there's, there's so much melody in, in those tunes. Look, I'm, I'm going to sneak in another tune here, Boris. I'm going to sneak in one of my favourites, which is heading right back to you. I think that's got a great riff, and I think that's one of your best vocals. Do you have any comment on that tune before we play it? Heading right back. <laughs> you caught me on the hop because I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't listened to those for um, probably ten years. Oh really? Um, okay. Yeah, that one I was kind of happy with. Mm. The other ones in the album, as I was saying earlier, I think we weren't in total control of, and 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 the producer was take, we're almost taking total control of it all, uh, but not so much with that one. No, we are heading right back. All right. I mean, and look, I I could have played anything from that album as I, as I think all those tunes are great. So. I guess I'm fast forwarding a little here. So if we go is it to '93 and and Chris Flynn is out of the band, and I, I remember seeing him one night at the Hopeton Hotel in Surrey Hills, fronting a mm. short-lived band called Surrey Hills 2010. Yeah. So w- why did he leave the band, or is that something best he answers? He, well, he didn't leave. He got booted out. <laughs> like Roddy. No, like Roddy, yeah. <laughs> but um, I think if you ever ask Chris, he he was. He was kind of out of control mm-hmm. um, on a number of fronts. Some to do with alcohol, mm-hmm. some to do with um, I don't know, just his life in general. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a better way to put it. But um, not t- totally out of control. But mm-hmm. as far as being in a band, it was totally out of control. You know, mm-hmm. like like mm-hmm. you, know, you, you could almost live a normal life. But in a band situation, it was yeah, you, you couldn't work with him anymore. Yeah. And I think you'd freely admit that as well. Uh, did that occur in Europe or did it occur back here? It occurred back here, but it was it was manifesting in Europe a lot, yeah. So the band released its final album in 94 with Medicine Wheel, which sound-wise sees the band's return to its early days in a number of ways with you up mm-hmm. front on vocals. Uh, Hernando's Hideaway, Under Your Skin, Holy Town. This album is certainly, I guess, a departure from Chrome, but perhaps... Um, more of a, a conscious change to the old, the older sound slightly. Was was this a difficult? And I, pre, I presume I know the answer. Now, was this a difficult album to record, and indeed difficult time for the band without Chris? Yeah, I guess it was a conscious, conscious decision to kind of head back in that direction. Was it a difficult one? I guess it was because um, on Audio Sonic and Chrome, Chris was a major part of that. So a lot of pressure went back onto well me and. Um, or us, whereas, you know, if, obviously if Chris was on that album, there'd be less pressure on me or, or the other mm-hmm. guys. Um, so it was, was a difficult album to record, yeah. Okay. And look, I, I don't recall any local dates. Um, did the band play any shows in Australia to support that album, or was it all European dates? No, I we didn't play any dates for that album, no. We okay. Just, we did it, and then... Um, James Baker went to live in Perth, you know, I don't know how long after the album, and then um, we just didn't, I guess we just didn't bother anymore. Mm. Were you were you disappointed in how it ended for the band? Not really. I mean, when, you, when it's happening, it, you, you know, you, when you're in the middle of it, uh, mm. things, things are happening like that. I mean, I was kind of happy that it, not, I'm not so happy, but I, I wasn't, displeased that it had finished because mm-hmm. um you know we've been playing for uh, such a long time and mm. and touring for such a long time and you know you, 
people just kind of want a break. So in, mm. in that regard, I wasn't I, I wasn't disappointed. I guess I was disappointed that we we could have with Chris we could have reached you know we could have we had more potential than than was actually um, put out. We still had some uh, good stuff to do, but we that, I guess that's my only regret. So I guess, you know, after that, you guys all move off into different fields and bands and other directions and and whatnot since the band broke up. And I, I guess today's forum is not what, where I want to talk about those mm. projects. However, I do want to, I guess, mention a couple of those projects, if I may. Firstly, as a Dubrovniks fan, I really embraced the Sonic Redemption album you did in 2005 with Black Dirt, not just because it saw you reunite with Chris Flynn, but in a number of ways it sounded like a continuation of the Dubrovniks to me. There's some strong songs on that, stuff like um, Move, Run, Girl Like You, all reminiscent of vintage Dubrovniks. And one song in particular, which I think is super, super strong, is Lisa Says. And if you're not including that in the band set for the forthcoming shows, then you should be. <laughs> how, how well did that album do? It seemed to be, again, it seemed to me to be released without much fanfare. I don't think it did that well. But I, I liked it a lot. It's some, there's some great songs on that album. Yeah. At that stage, I didn't have the kind of... Um, even though we recorded the album, I didn't have... I wasn't in the right frame of mind to okay. promote it. Um, okay. I was kind of getting... I was kind of getting out of control. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so um, that, that's probably what happened there. But now I'm not out of control anymore. Okay. By the way. So I guess it's, you know, it's ironic to me anyway that in this sort of, you know, post download era in which we live nowadays, mm. live shows have become a, a musician's sole source of, of reliable income. Whereas, you know, once you, whereas you once toured to promote albums, now bands release albums to promote tours. As, as mm. a guy who has experienced the highs and lows of the music industry, do you, do you have an, an opinion on the state of the music business nowadays? I guess it seems like there's a lot more bands than there was. I don't know, is, mm. that, is, that, is that your impression? I think there's certainly more bands. I think there's less... I think it's forest from the trees kind of stuff. I think yeah. it's harder for people to to find really good stuff because nowadays everyone can record an album in their in their yeah. bedroom, put it up on yeah. YouTube, and they're flooding the, the, the market with so much yeah. rubbish that it's hard for people to hear the good stuff. Like Whereas once before it wasn't. They didn't have those platforms no. to, to promote themselves. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I think as well. But, you know, mm. I, I don't necessarily... Sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, that's that, that's what I would I would say is kind of the good and the bad about it all is that um anyone can record and everything's getting diluted. I'm, I'm you know I'm obviously just talking about um kind of indie music as well. I'm not mm, um, mm. or indie rock or whatever. I'm not really you know obviously the mainstream charts uh, have always have always kind of been the same you know to me. Mm. I, I don't I haven't got really an opinion on on what's happening on kind of that side of the industry. You know whether uh, Katy Perry is losing out instead of selling 10 million singles she only sells 8 million yeah. you know like yeah. Um, I, yeah I don't know you know like sure. is that a bad thing or a good thing and I'm not sure I'm not sure that it's affected say the indie indie rock kind of mm. um, scene so much because yeah bands can record uh, easier and, and, and release it and I don't know it seems like it's, it's, it's it's just evolving that way. Mm, mm, yeah, I mean, mm. and by that I mean you couldn't stay the, the way it was, you know. Otherwise, it would just somehow stagnate. Not, not, yeah, that, not that, not that the way it was was bad. I'm saying if, no. it, was, if it was still like that now, if you think about it, there'd be something kind of smelly about it, you know, in a way. Mm, mm, you know, if, if mm. it hasn't kind of evolved somehow. Okay, I, I guess I also want to mention your two solo albums, which I think are both, you know, pretty pretty damn fine albums. 2007's Fuzz Machine and 2013's Desperate Girl, both of which were released in Spain on Bang Records. I guess a, a market which have always been um, fans of yours. Did you tour Spain to support those releases? No. No? no? Okay. Yeah. They're still available to pick up those albums? On Bang, maybe, yeah. All right, so... 
four albums and hundreds of shows with the Dubrovniks. Your debut album nominated for an aria, Fireball of Love, going to number one on the Australian indie charts. She Got No Love going to top 40 on the national charts. There were plenty of highlights. Do you have any personal high points or shows or memories that stand out in your mind as significant for you? Well, yeah, there's there some funny, funny shows. One of our first shows at the Trade Union Club we did, Roddy used to dress up as a turban. We had a turban, some kind of Raj kind of turban. So one night we all, all put on Raj tur- turbans, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like I remember that one was um, that was a good show for, for you know no other reason as we just had turbans on you know <laughs> um, but you know like like it's hard it's, I guess it's hard to um, yeah to, to to pick a highlight um, mm. um, when you're kind of living through it all some of the shows in Europe I can't I, I don't know the names but some of them on that first tour we did with um that was when Chris just joined the band, we were just kind of, yeah, they were, they were firing on all four, on all eight cylinders, you know. None, none that I, in particular, but that tour, that particular tour, we were, um, we were really on fire, you know. Mm. Um, that's probably what gave us our, um, our longevity in Europe, really, for mm-hmm. some of those shows that we did. Um, um, yeah, but like I said, I can't name any. Okay, so it's, 2015 and the band are back together. Other mm. other than the, the Euro tour, which is booked, mm. are you writing or are there plans to record any new material or any other shows, Australian shows, than the ones that are already been booked? Well, yes, there is. Before we go, we're going to Perth to rehearse it's June, June 6th. Yeah, I'll, I'll read out the dates in a sec. Yeah. Uh, um, yep. And it's basically his wedding as well. Okay. So we're playing there, the scientists are playing, the victims are playing, everyone's playing at this, at this um, mm-hmm. he's basically wedding. So we're doing that. I think when we get back from Europe, there's, because of that show we're doing in Perth, I think we're trying to replicate it in Melbourne. Okay, that'll be good. So we're going to do a show there. So um, that, that, at this stage, there's, there's a show before we go, which is June, the, uh, some early June. Mm-hmm. And the show in Melbourne, which is mid July sometime, and that, that's okay. the only plans we've got at the moment. Okay, so I'll just cover your dates for anyone listening outside of Australia. Uh, June twelve in Athens, Greece. June fifteen in Thessaloniki. Mm-hmm. Oh, I knew I'd get that wrong. In uh, Greece, Thessaloniki. Uh, yeah. th- thank you very much. Uh, oh, there's, one in, Kina... yeah. there's one in between Sorry, it now. Yeah. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah. Okay, the Esquina Rock Festival in Spain on June 19 with yeah. ZZ Top. Television L7, D Generation, many others. June 22, if you are in uh, Vienna, you can see the band there. So I guess the best place for people to check out is the uh, Dubrovniks um, webpage. Website, yeah. yeah. Website, yeah. okay. So more dates to be announced, so people need to check that out for upcoming dates. Yeah, there's one or two um, that, 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 that'll that be uh, worth doing, yeah. But... Um, that's basically it, yeah. Okay, the Dubro- uh, sorry, the Dubrovniks.com is the address there. So, um, look, before you go, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, your, your music, not just with the Dubrovniks, um, but any number of bands, has been the soundtrack to my life and, and to thousands of others who appreciate cool rock and roll, mm. who've grown up with your music, and I have very fond uh, memories of seeing you in countless pubs with your thumping bass still resonating in my ears. I'm glad that the Dubrovniks are back and I wish you guys every success in 2015. Thank you. Lastly, every guest on the show gets to request an Australian song. It can be one of yours or a song by an Australian band that has meaning for you. What would you like to choose? I'd like to choose um, Psycho from the Beast of Bourbon. Only, only the fact that um, well, that sticks in my mind because <laughs> When we, like when the Beast of Bourbon, we really kind of rehearsed, and when we um, when we rehearsed to do that first album, the Axman's Jazz, we only did it a few times. And Psycho's got a kind of few key changes in, and I could never kind of we rehearsed once, and and probably spasmodically rehearse three or four weeks later, and so I'd, I could never, I'd, I'd always fuck it up. Okay. Every, every time I played it, I'd fuck it up. <laughs> and, so when we went in to record that. 
we were recording it like a tape. There was, we weren't overdubbing or anything. And as we as the tape started rolling, I go, oh, fuck, here we go, right? But <laughs> for some strange reason, <laughs> I didn't fuck up on the recording. I, um, it's the first time I've ever played it without without making a mistake. So that kind of goes a long way to kind of, I don't know, I guess when people say there's the right kind of feel in the room and things are happening, you know, you, can, you kind of do superhuman things. So I, I guess that's my kind of superhuman effort was um, not to fuck okay. that up. Because it could have, <laughs> could, could, it could have put a dampener on the whole session, you know. Because like I say, mm. we're doing it live. To, we're just doing it live, even though it's in a studio. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> and as you should be, uh, yeah. here we go out with The Beast of Bourbon and Psycho. Thanks for your time today, Boris. Thank you very much.